intervening years, I have traveled to refugee camps and slums, visited sites of genocide and mass starvation, and over and over again, I have come to one conclusion, that progress is possible everywhere, even in the most challenging environments. We live in a world of apparent inequality, where 1% of the world's population controls 50% of its wealth. And yet there are 1 billion people who live on about a dollar a day making daily choices between food and medicine, between shoes and paying fees to go to school. Choices that defy the very definition of a life of basic human dignity. And we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on in the world that makes such extreme poverty persist, but better, we're going to talk about what's changing that. And I'll ask you to join me in rebelling against the idea that it can't end. And are we on the right path? In 1980, one in every two people on the planet was living in extreme poverty. As that rate began to fall, world leaders working through institutions like the United Nations and USAID committed to what seemed like an impossible goal to cut extreme poverty in half between 1990 and 2015. And not only did we reach that goal, but we got there five years early. And if you live on less than $1.25 a day, if you live in that kind of poverty, this is not just data, this is everything. If you're a parent who wants the best for your kids, and I am, this rapid transition is a route out of despair and into hope. And guess what? If the trajectory continues, look where the amount of people living on $1.25 a day gets to by 2030. Can't be true, can it? That's what the data is telling us. If the trajectory continues, we get to, wow, the, the zero zone. For number crunchers like us, that is the erogenous zone. So, virtual elimination of extreme poverty, as defined by people living on less than $1.25 a day, adjusted, of course, for inflation from a 1990 baseline. We do live a good baseline. We can't get this done until we really accept that we can get this done. Look at this graph. It's called inertia. It's how we screw it up. And the next one is really beautiful. It's called momentum. And it's how we can bend the arc of history down towards zero, just doing the things that we know work. So inertia versus momentum. There is jeopardy. And of course, the closer you get, it gets harder. I believe that the greatest failure of the human race is the fact that we've left more than one billion of our members behind. Hunger extreme poverty. These often seem like gigantic, insurmountable problems, too big to solve. But as a field practitioner, I believe these are actually very solvable problems if we just take the right strategies. Archimedes was an ancient Greek thinker, and he taught us that if we lean on the right levers, we can move the world. In the fight against extreme poverty, I believe there are three powerful levers that we can lean on. This talk is all about those levers and why they make poverty a winnable fight in our lifetimes. What is extreme poverty? When I first moved to rural East Africa, I stayed overnight with a farm family. They were wonderful people. They invited me into their home, we sang songs together, they ate a simple dinner, they gave me a blanket to sleep on the floor. In the morning, however, there was nothing to eat. And then at lunchtime, I watched with an increasingly sick feeling as the eldest girl in the family cooked porridge as a substitute for lunch. For that meal, every child drank one cup to survive. And I cannot tell you how ashamed I felt when they handed one of those cups to me, and I knew I had to accept their hospitality. Children need food not only to survive, but also to grow physically and mentally. Every day they fail to eat, they lose a little bit of their future. Amongst the extreme poor, one in three children are permanently stunted from a lifetime of not eating enough. 
When that's combined with poor access to health care, one in ten extremely poor children die before they reach age five, and only one quarter of children complete high school because they lack school fees. Hunger and extreme poverty curb human potential in every possible way. Global poverty has powerful levers. It's a problem like any other. I live and work in the field, and as a practitioner, I believe these are very solvable problems. So, for the next 10 minutes, let's not be sad about the state of the world. Let's engage our brains. Let's engage our collective passion for problem solving and figure out what those levers are. Lever number one: Most of the world's poor are farmers. Think about how extraordinary this is. If this picture represents the world's poor, then more than half engage in farming as a major source of income. This gets me really excited. You know, all of these people, one profession. We only have two ways we can feed the world: we can either make our existing farmland a lot more productive, or we can clear-cut forest and savanna to make more farmland, which would be environmentally disastrous. Farmers are basically a really important leverage point. When farmers become more productive, they earn more income, they climb out of poverty, they feed their communities, and they reduce environmental land pressure. This really shows you we have not seen good economic and health progress anywhere in the world. Without、uh, destroying the climate, and this is really what has to be changed. I've been criticised for showing a too positive <coughs> image of the world, but but、um, I don't think it's like this. The world is quite a messy place. This we can call Dollar Street. Everyone lives on this street here. What they earn here, what the number they live on, is how much they earn per day. This family earns about one dollar per day. We drive up the street here. We find a family here. Which earns about two to three dollar a day, and we earn drive away here. We find the first garden in the street, and they earn ten to fifty dollars a day. And how do they live? If we look at the bed here, we can see that they sleep on a rug on the floor. This is what poverty line is. Eighty percent of the family income is just to cover the energy need, the food for the day. This is. Two to five dollar. You have a bed, and here it's a much nicer bedroom. You can see. I lectured this for IKEA, and they wanted to see the sofa immediately here. <laughs> and, and this is the sofa, how it will emerge from there. And the interesting thing, when you go around here in the photo panorama, you see the family still sitting on the floor there. And although there is a sofa, if you watch in the kitchen, you can see that the great difference for women does not come between one to ten dollar; it comes beyond here. When you really can get good working condition in in、uh, the family, and if you really want to see the difference, you look at the toilet over here. This can change. This can change. These are all pictures and images from Africa, and it can become much better. We can get out of poverty. My own research has not been in IT or anything like this. I spent 20 years in interviews with African farmers, which was on the verge of famine. And this is the result of the farmers' needs researches. The nice thing here is that you can't see who are the researchers on this picture. That's when research functions in poor societies. You must really live with the people. When you are in poverty, it's everything is about survival. It's about having food. And these two young farmers—they are girls now because the parents are dead in HIV and AIDS. They discuss with the trained agronomist. This is one of the best agronomists in Malawi, Jonathan Mikombira,、huh? and he's discussing about what sort of cassava they would plant. The best converter of sunshine to food that man has found, and they are very, very eagerly interested to get advice. That's to survive in poverty. That's one context. Getting out of poverty. The women told us one thing: get us technology. We hate this mortal. To stand hours and hours, get us a mill so that we can mill our flowers. Then we will be able to pay for the rest ourselves. Technology will bring you out of 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 poverty, but there's a need for a market to get away from poverty. And this woman is very happy now bringing her products to the market, but she's very thankful for the public investments in schooling, so she can count and won't be cheated when she reaches the market. She wants her kid to be healthy, so she can go to the market and doesn't have to stay home.、Huh? And she wants the infrastructure that's nice with a paved road.、Huh? That's also good with credits. Microcredits gave her the, the bicycle, you know, and information will tell her when to go to market with which products. You, know. you can do this. I find my my experience from 20 years of Africa is that the seemingly impossible is possible. Africa has not done bad. In 50 years, they've gone from pre-medieval situation to a very decent 100 years ago Europe. 
with a functioning national state. I would say that Sub-Saharan Africa have done best in the world during the last 50 years, because we don't consider where they came from. It's this stupid concept of developing countries, which put us Argentina and Mozambique together 50 years ago and said that Mozambique did worse. We have to know a little more about the world. I have a neighbor who knows 200 types of wine. He knows everything. He knows the name of the grape, the temperature, and everything. I only know two types of wine, red and white. <laughs> But my neighbor only know two types of countries, industrialized and developing, and I know 200. I know about the, the small data about it. You can do that. 